And um, okay, so we've been talking about um, the whole, um, you know, the whole family thing and um, raising kids and, and, and all that stuff. And uh, so we're going to continue on that thought tonight. And um, I, I want to deal with something tonight that is, um, you know, one of the reasons that sometimes people's parenting really gets messed up is because there's something that they believe that is wrong. And, and so they're not trying to be foolish. They're not trying to be stupid, but they believe something that's wrong. And, and uh, you know, like, you know, if, if you believing, believe eating gravel is good for your teeth, um, you know, you're going to have serious issues. And, and you know, you, some people can try to reason with you, but if you really believe gravel is good for your teeth, it's going to, you know, you're going to wind up toothless, you know. <laughs> and, um, you know, and, and, and the problem is, you know, somebody taught them that. You know, maybe maybe everybody in their family, maybe they, you know, all their family members chewed gravel and 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 you know, so I'm I'm just being facetious, but 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 you know, sometimes that's what happens. And there are some really bad philosophies that have floated around in our in North America for the last 75 years, and um and you hear people say things. And the problem is, is, you know, again, you expect lost people to believe some wrong things. I mean, that's just, you just expect that. The problem is when you hear God's people, um, and I, I use that term, I, you know what, I'm, re I'm referring to the people that, that love the Lord and they love the Bible and they read the Bible and yet, and they go to a decent churches and yet they still, there's something that they've adopted that is that is it's very flawed thinking. So I want to deal with one of those tonight. Um, so if you're writing stuff down, I, I there's a, a lie that people believe, and I'll give it to you in three words, and then I'm gonna we're gonna talk about it. That strictness causes rebellion. And when I'm done tonight, I hopefully by the grace of God you will see that that is absolute baloney. There are some things that do cause. Now, now I, I will say this, and, and I'm probably getting ahead of myself. Um, of course, we all know somebody that was a nutcase that abused their kids. Okay, you know, and, and you can take anything to an extreme. What is, what is drug abuse? What about all these people that are, that are hooked on prescription drugs? Um, you know, we, we were talking the other day, it, it, and it's getting to be very common. But I remember my grandmother. You know, my grandmother, up above her sink, she had a shelf, and it was lined with, with uh, prescription stuff. Now, she was not taking it to enjoy it. You know, she was taking it because the doc prescribed this and the doc prescribed this. And, and you know, and, and, and that's becoming more and more normal in our world. Um, but you've got people that abuse prescription drugs. I'll never forget sitting in a specialist office. Oh, I don't know. It's 15, 15, 20 years ago. And uh, he looked at me and we were discussing, you know, asthma. Okay. And, um, and uh, we were discussing the puffers, you know, and uh, this guy was really a really sharp cookie. He wasn't your, you know, I'm, I'm going to have trouble qualifying every statement. So you're going to have to bear with me. If you've got a question, come and see me after. But we do know that, some docs, they, they just like to prescribe and, you know, they say there's a financial benefit in it for them. I don't know about all that, but it sure seems that way. Um, but this doc wasn't like that. And we were discussing it and, and, um, and he was discussing ways to deal with that issue. And then he said to me, he said, at that time I had had a little trouble with uh, allergy induced asthma. And so I used a puffer off and on. I didn't use the steroid when I hadn't had, to, I didn't need to, but I used the other one. And, um, and he said, you know, there's a new medicine that's come out. And he said, you ought to, you ought to try this because he said it would eliminate the need for the inhaler. And uh, so we were discussing all that. And then he made a statement. He said, now he said, let's not confuse the issue. He says, there is a time when that inhaler is necessary. You know, 
he didn't know if I was going to go off the deep end and throw out my inhalers. And then one day I was going to pass out the floor because I didn't have an inhaler somewhere, you know, and people are like that. People will often go from one extreme to another. And, um, and so we understand, I trust that there are extremes and abuse is an extreme. Okay. But what happens is, um, People don't always differentiate that. So if you've been following along the last, last several weeks, you know, one of the things we keep stressing is, you know, you know, you need to be on this thing of enforcing obedience and it needs to be enforced. They need to, obedience is last week. What were the two words? Prompt and cheerful. And if it's not prompt and cheerful, it's not obedience. And so we're, we're really, we're really riding this thing. And why is that? Because in our society, what is rampant is these parents that have almost no control over their children. I mean, in our churches and, and they'll look at their kids and, and it's very widespread. I mean, it's like, it's, I, I think we could safely say 75% of the, of the kids of the young parents in our kind of churches have very little control because they, they, they say, Johnny, you know, don't do this. And they got to tell him five times and then he still does it. And it's just, it's just, and it's just off the wall. So what have we been stressing? You know, you need to put a stop to that. Well, right away, there'll be somebody that will hear this kind of teaching and and maybe you'll be excited about it. And maybe, and you know, we're going to share some things yet that will help you with all of that. And you're going to get excited about it. And you know what you're going to do in your, in your, excitement in your gladness you're going to tell some other christian and they're going to go well i don't know about all that stuff you know you when you're strict with your kids they just go haywire when they get old and then they're going to give you two or three examples and you're going to go oh wow because you've heard that before and it's not true and i'm going to tell you why um People believe things like this because they've heard it over and over again. They believe it because they've experienced it. They think, you know, well, you know, I grew up in one of them kind of homes and man, I went wild. Okay, we'll we'll, we'll come back to that. They think they've seen this occur in another family. And what you really believe, here's the problem. When you believe something like this, boy, you better make sure that you're believing the right thing. Because what you really believe affects how you live and do things. If you believe wrong, you will function wrong, even in the goodness of your heart. If you draw a wrong conclusion, it will cause you to make a wrong decision in a given area. Many people draw wrong conclusions because they don't think things through and they don't think accurately. It's just too easy to make a quick surface assessment And then you draw a conclusion that often messes them up for the rest of their life. Um, And it's, it's very easy to draw a conclusion that fits your comfort zone. And you have to be careful for that. I saw it the other day, you know, one of the themes you're, you'll hear in, uh, in, you know, your, your Hollywood stuff. And even in the stuff that's supposed to be decent You know, a lot of times you'll hear a philosophy that is iterated and reiterated that's totally wrong. And God's people believe it. You know, I heard it the other day. Somebody said, and and I've heard it several times in the last few weeks. I don't know why. Maybe God wanted me to remember it. You know, just, you just need to follow your heart. You just need to, you need to follow your heart. To which we reply. Have you read what the Bible says about your heart? Jeremiah 9, 17. The heart is deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Your heart will lie to you over and over and over and over again. And you know why you're deceived by it? Because it sounds like your voice. Because it's your heart. The wisest man that ever lived said, outside of the Lord Jesus, Solomon. Solomon said in the book of Proverbs, he that trusteth in his own heart is a fool. But boy, this world, they ride that. 
Follow your heart. Listen to your heart. Well, you better think about that one. The Bible says just the opposite. Let me give you an example of uh, something outside of our subject, but it really illustrates the point of drawing the wrong conclusion. Um, you know, there's health food stores everywhere and, and, you know, you, you need to take care of yourself and you need to, you, you, you really do need to take care of yourself. God gave you a body. Uh, your body is the temple of the Holy ghost. Um, you know, I, I know you can be a nutcase and you can, you can be a pain in the neck and you can, you know, it, but you know what? Here's, here's, here's something I, I remember years ago, uh, we were sitting around a table and we were trying to, we were just trying to be a blessing, trying to help somebody, you know, and I don't diagnose people and I don't know the solution to everybody's problem. And I do have enough sense to know that what helps one person doesn't help another, like, like health foodie, you know, you'll say, oh, you know, I did this and it helped me. And the truth is it did help them. And it, it may be very good and it may be very healthy 80% of the time. But that doesn't always mean it's going to fix this person's problem. But by the way, that's true in the medical world. There's people that have taken a certain treatment and, it, and a bunch of them got well. And, and somebody else took the treatment and it did nothing. So that's very true. But, you know, I, I remember one day we're sitting around talking and all of a sudden this guy, and he was a preacher, you know, for whatever that's worth. <laughs> he, he was a he was a preacher and he looked at me and he sort of slapped me in the face you know and he said he said um he said well all that all that health food stuff is new age so as soon as i heard that i thought okay you know he, he's not asking any questions man he'd really help some people if before they would spout off if they'd ask a few questions but you know i could tell okay his mind is made up and i thought whoa i better back off this talk why do, why do they think that? Well, because as soon as you think that, you have cut yourself off from a whole vein of possible help. I'm not saying it's going to fix your problem. But you have cut yourself off from a whole sphere of, of possibilities. Why, why would you do that? Well, what people do that. People embrace that conclusion because... Someone they look up to said it. You need to remember that just because you love so-and-so, you know, on the internet, and they might be, ha have a PhD, and they might really be smart, but you need to be careful about just swallowing something because they said it. They, they, they assume that all that health food stuff is new age because someone they don't like said it. Someone they don't like said, oh, I like health food. And they think, well, if he likes it, I'm not going to like it. Well, that's really, that's really bright. Um, sometimes they embrace that conclusion because they knew they know a new age weirdo who promotes health food. And, and I'm telling you, man, there's some of them out there. They're like out on another planet somewhere. And they take every supplement in the world so that as they smoke dope, they're healthy. Well, hello. We won't get, we won't get off on that one. And here's another reason. Sometimes there are health food stores that, and, that will promote new age practices. Okay, so they draw a conclusion without much thought, without looking into it. And, and, and you know, it was just easier to not take care of yourself anyway. So this conclusion fits into their comfort zone. But it is a wrong conclusion. Um. I know a guy, I, I probably know a bunch of these, and you probably do too, that had a harsh father that was, you know, hot-tempered and um, verged on abusive. And so he left home, got married, and you know what he swore? He swore he was never going to spank his kids, and he was going to be very permissive and lenient, and he was going to be their buddy. Can I tell you where his kids are today? It's one big, sad story. See, he drew a wrong conclusion. 
he thought, well, I don't want to be my, my dad, so I'm going to swing to the opposite end of the spectrum. And you know what he discovered? But he discovered way too late that that was not the solution. Um, so what is rebellion caused by? Okay, so let's consider that for a moment. Go to Isaiah chapter 1. What does cause rebellion? And there are several things. The first thing that causes rebellion, and by the way, this is the only one you have no control over. Now I'm talking about, you know, here you are, you're raising your kids. You love, you know, you, you love your kids. You're trying to raise them for God. You're, you're praying. You're, you're doing the best you know how. And nobody's perfect. And we all make mistakes. We understand that. But you're doing the best you can. You're trying to be, you're trying to be consistent. And this is what throws people for a loop. Why is it that some families, the mom and the dad really did love the Lord. And, and even their kids will acknowledge. I remember talking to a kid at U of A. Oh, he was, a, he was, a, we, we were, there was a bunch of us, him, a bunch of the guys. It was back in the, when um, Sean Holtz was here and we were down on the U of A campus on the, on the safe zones where you're allowed to talk to people. Cause you know, they'll throw you off if you get in a, and so we're on the safe zones. We're talking to people. And uh, this this two or three young guys and this one guy, he uh, he was he was sharp like he he was not he was not uh, your typical you know guy that was you know half stoned out of his mind. He was sharp and he looked at me. He said, "You are making me so angry." He said, "I want to punch you in the face." And I was being really nice, really I was. I was just giving him the gospel, and I looked at him and I said, and then he said, "My dad's a preacher," and I said, "Oh." And you know what I assumed? I assumed it's another one of those sad stories. And I said, I said, I called him by name. I don't remember his name. I'll call him Tom. I said, Tom. I said, man, I said, I, I'm not trying to make you angry at all. I said, I'm just, I'm just trying to get you to think about these things. I said, your dad, he's a preacher. I said, was he a hypocrite? I said, I understand that. I understand why you would want to throw it all out if your dad was a rascal. And he goes, shocked me. He goes, and it softened him immediately. He said, no. He said, my dad wasn't a hypocrite. So why was his son? Why had his son ran so far the other direction? And that's what confuses people. They'll say, well, see there, you know, they were just strict and the kid went wild. No, you're, you're, you're forgetting something. Look at Isaiah chapter one. The Lord is talking. Isaiah one, verse two. Hear, O heavens, and give ear, O earth, for the Lord hath spoken, quote, I have nourished and brought up children, and they have rebelled against me. Can I ask you who the best, most consistent, most loving, most caring person in the universe is? And you know what God said? God said, in the book of Isaiah, you know what the prophets are full of? They're full of judgments against Israel and Judah and then also, of course, against the nations. But but he, he looks at Israel and he says, I have, God says, I have brought up children and they have rebelled against me. Boy, they sure couldn't blame their father. They sure couldn't blame him. Look at Isaiah 5 verse 1. Isaiah 5, verse 1. Now will I sing to my well-beloved a song of my beloved touching his vineyard. My well-beloved hath a vineyard in a very fruitful hill, and he fenced it and gathered out the stones thereof and planted it with the choicest vine and built a tower in the midst of it and also made a wine press therein. And he looked that it should bring forth grapes, and it brought forth. It, it, this was not supposed to happen. What, what, the wild grapes are the, the sour, puny, worthless things. He said it brought forth wild grapes. 
And now, O inhabitants of Jerusalem and the men of Judah, judge, I pray you, betwixt me and my vineyard. Now, look what he says. What could have been done more to my vineyard that I have not done in it? Wherefore, when I looked that it should bring forth grapes, brought it forth wild grapes, God said, what more could I have done? He said, this, he said, this fruit is not what I labor to produce. Now, you don't have to turn there. And we just uh, we just read it the other day. But in Luke 15, you have the story of the prodigal son. And um, and, you know, we commented, you know, in that story that the parable, of the prodigal son, the father in that in that story is a picture of God, the father. And God, the father had two sons. It's interesting how you can have children raised in the same house. And some will do right. And some will not. He had two sons. One was the perfect child. A little, little bit snooty and bitter at the end, but he was the perfect child. But the other went out into the far country. They both had the same dad. Okay, so rebellion is caused by, or it can be caused, first of all, by a wicked heart, because every kid has one. And, and really what this highlights for you and me is the desperate need of prayer that God will work in their heart. Psalm 127.1 says, except the Lord build the house, they labor in vain that build it. And just to encourage you, I, I remember um, a, a young man, and I knew his dad, and um, the boy got to be about 12 years old. And, and the boy was just, and these parents they, I looked up to these parents and and they had they actually had a great influence on Mitzi and I. And um they were just amazing. But their 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 boy, and we we found this out later, their oldest son, when he was about 12, he was getting unmanageable. These parents were Bible believing, they were doing it right. All the things that I've told you, much of it I learned from them. And they said, but this boy, he, he, it was not getting, he was 12 years old. And finally, one day the dad thought, okay, I'm doing all the mechanics, right? I'm expecting immediate obedience. I'm disciplining him, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. All the things you're supposed to do. And he said, but there's a problem here. And he said, he said, the problem is my son's heart. And he said, I went alone and he said, I started pleading with God privately to work in his heart. And he said, one day, not long after that, he said his will broke. And from that day on, he was one of the best children I had. I know that kid today. He's in his 30s today. And he's, uh, I, I last I heard, he was taking over the church his dad pastored. He, it's, it's one of those, and they lived happily ever after. But you know what the dad realized? He realized that though he was doing all the right things, that what was missing was the work of God because the dad, you know, you, you can control, you, you really can to a great degree, especially when they're younger. You, you control their outside world, but you cannot reach that wicked heart. And you can have all your ducks in a row and, and there's other things that cause rebellion and you might not be guilty of all the rest that we're going to mention. But there is one thing that you need to plead with God and that is their wicked heart. Okay, the second one is, so one of the things that rebellion is caused by is a wicked heart. The second thing it's caused by is wrong companions. And we we talked about that quite a bit several weeks ago. Um, wrong companions. The third thing that causes rebellion is rules without reason. Rules without reason. Rules that make no sense. Because no reason is given. And it's always because I said so. And they are not allowed to ask questions. Now, look, um, I, I believe that when you when you give a command, uh, you um it needs to be obeyed immediately. I mean, there's times, you know, and we, we've given you some examples, you know, the house is on fire, you know, or there's a poisonous snake behind Johnny. And, and it's like, Johnny, jump to me. You know, it's not the time to have an extended discussion about why. 
You know, it's like that kid better move. And that's what you're trying to train. But, um, you know, is it wrong for your kids to ask questions? No, but they need to understand, you know, you give them a command, you tell them we need to do it this way. And, um, and their response should be, yes, ma'am, no, ma'am, yes, sir, no, sir. The obedience is immediate. And then if there's a question, if there's, you know, you're at church and, you know, and, and I don't know, I was trying to think of an example. You know, there are times when something needs to happen just right now. Um, there's just something, and you just look at it and you say, uh, I, my kids are grown. But I looked at one of my kids the other day and I said, we are in a public place. And I mouthed to them. I said, don't do this. And I'll tell you why later. And they're like, okay. You ought to be able to tell them. And they ought to be able to ask questions. And there better be a good reason. Now, they may not always understand the reason. But you know, they're going to pick up real quick if you're reasonable or not. Do you know who the most reasonable being in the universe is? God the Father. Isaiah 118. Come now and let us reason together. God says, you don't want to know why? He says, I'll, I'll tell you why. Rules without reason. There, there are unreasonable restrictions sometimes where some somebody, you know, there are people like this. We have a word for it. You know, we, we say, oh, yeah, yeah, so-and-so was power tripping. You know, um, um, you know, there's rules for the sake of rules. There's rules just to exert authority, you know. Um, it's not because something is right or this pleases God or it's for their good. It's all about satisfying a warped sense of I'm the boss and I'm going to prove it to everybody. Okay, you know what that is? That's unreasonable. That's unreasonable. That will, You want to trigger rebellion? That's a surefire way to do it. That's a surefire way to do it. Let me give you another thing that causes rebellion. And some of these are so simple. You know, they're just really simple. Another one is hypocrisy. Hypocrisy is absolutely deadly, especially when it comes to the home. Hypocrisy is about appearing to be something that you really are not. And by the way, you cannot expect your children to be what you are not. Your example is critical. There's there's a, there's a testimony we have at home in a book, and, and I, I should try to find the book. Some of you would really enjoy it. There's this guy, true story. He became a missionary with Northern Canada Evangelical Mission. And, um, and he tells about the home that he grew up in, and it was extremely abusive. Big family. Uh, early, early, you know, 1920s, 1930s, and uh, very abusive but, you know, the family went to church. And, of course, when the family went to church, everything was wonderful. You know, they had eight or ten kids in the family. And, and everybody thought their family was wonderful because they knew that if they ever let the cat out of the bag, their dad was absolutely going to kill them. Um, he, he, he was abusive to them. He was abusive to the mom, like horribly. And, um, and uh, he... He, the dad, you know, again, again, people thought he was the, they thought he was the ideal Christian man in the church. They thought he was one of the pillars of the assembly. And, um, but he swore like a sailor. And, um, and so one day the, uh, the pastor is um, going to get, uh, the pastor gets invited over to the, to the house for, for lunch. And so he comes and boy, everybody's just in picture perfect form. And, and, um, and one of the youngest ones was also a little girl and the pastor gets teasing the little girl. Well, he, he irritated her and he got teasing her. And, and this little girl, she, she looked at him and she said, stop. And he, you know, and he keeps going on. And finally she said, you blankety blank, 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 just turn the air blue. <laughs> Guess where she learned that? You know what they're going to be? They're going to be what we are. Your example is critical. More, oh, you've heard it and it's so true. More is caught than taught.
Your example is critical. They must see spiritual reality. You know, they're not going to see perfection. We, we all wish they did. But they need to see that Christianity is real and it's working and it's being lived out in your body. You know, my dad wasn't perfect and I knew some of his faults and flaws. But one thing I know about my dad was from the day he got saved when I was six years old to the day he died eight years later, eight years later, he loved the Lord. He was real as real can be. And I caught him privately on his knees in the middle of the night. You guys heard me tell that probably 10 times. You know what, you know what I knew? I, I saw my dad and I thought, boy, this is real. And it just, it stirred me. It stirred me. I wanted what he had. They need to see you denying yourself and staying sweet under hardship and being able to bear reproach. They need to see you turning away from evil and standing and living on God's word and enjoying God. They need to see that. And if you are pretending to be something that you're not, your family will very quickly lose all respect for you. And your rules, now when you're little, you know, they they have to live under your rules. And they, they understand that. But there reaches this point where they're thinking, okay, my day of freedom is coming. And your rules will eventually mean nothing to them because God's rules mean nothing to you. And they will resent and despise you. And when you need the power of influence the most, you will not have it. Hypocrisy is absolutely. You say, well, you know, all their kids went crazy. I wonder what happened. Well, you know, the bottom line is, you know, you, you, you don't know unless, unless you have an inside line there. Unless you have the inside scoop, you know, you, you don't know. You don't know. <laughs> until you talk to one of the kids. Then you might find out. A lot of people have a wrong view of leadership, and I want to wind up on this one tonight and we're done. Look at 1 Kings chapter 12. Strictness does not cause rebellion. Now, now unreasonable strictness does, of course. So, so uh, this one is um, what causes rebellion is being a tyrant instead of a loving leader, okay? Being a tyrant. Hey, listen, you, you know, the, you know, if you're in charge, you know, you know, dad, you know, you, you got the final say and you're, um, you're, you're in charge and God, God put you there. Mom, when dad's not there and you're in charge of those kids, you're, you're in charge, man, you got... And, and you shouldn't be playing a dip by a different set of rules and dad's not there. Uh, you're to guide the house. Guide the house doesn't mean you change the direction. Guide the house means you're following the direction and you're leading those behind you. Um, but there is a difference between, you know, you know, making sure that right is done and being a tyrant. And so, and there's a Bible example. This is the classic passage on leadership in, in the Bible. Um, it's first Kings 12. Read it with me. And Rehoboam went to Shechem where all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. And it came to pass when Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who was yet in Egypt, heard of it, for he was fled from the presence of King Solomon and Jeroboam dwelt in Egypt. That they sent and called him. And Jeroboam and all the congregation of Israel came and spake unto Rehoboam, saying, now watch what they tell Rehoboam. Thy father, Solomon, thy father made our yoke grievous. Solomon, wise as he was towards the end of his life, he really went off the rails. And one of the things he did, he overtaxed the people greatly. Okay, he, he became a burden to them. Okay, verse four, thy father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, Rebo, make thou the grievous service of thy father, and his heavy yoke, which he put upon us lighter, and we will serve thee. 
And he said unto them, Depart yet for three days, then come again to me. And the people departed. And King Rehoboam consulted with the old men that stood before Solomon his father while he yet lived and said, How do ye advise that I may answer this people? And they spake unto him, saying, Now what you're about to read are some of the greatest words about how to be a leader, how to be in charge of anybody, anywhere, in any condition. Okay, verse 7. And they spake unto him, saying, If thou wilt be a servant unto this people this day, and wilt serve them. Notice he says it twice. And answer them. And speak good words to them. Then they will be thy servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men, which they had given him, and consulted with the young men, which were grown up with him, and which stood before him. And he said unto them, What counsel give ye that we may answer this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke which thy father did put upon us lighter. And the young men that were grown up with him spake unto him, saying, Thus shalt thou speak unto this people that spake unto thee, saying, Thy father made our yoke heavy, but make thou it lighter unto us. Thus shalt thou say unto them, My little finger shall be thicker than my father's loins. And now, whereas my father did lay you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father hath chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day as the king had appointed, saying, Come to me again the third day. And the king answered the people roughly and forsook the old men's counsel that they gave him and spake to them after the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made our yoke heavy, and I will add to your yoke. My father also chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with the scorpions. So what happened? Wherefore the king hearkened not to the people. Go down to verse 16. So when all Israel saw that the king hearkened not unto them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, O Israel. Now see to thine own house, David. So Israel departed into the tents. What just happened in verse 16? There were 12 tribes in Israel, okay? And 10 of those tribes said, Rehoboam, we're out of here. We're going to, and you, you guys, some of you know the story. They, they made their own king. Rehoboam absolutely split the kingdom. It was never the same after that. And why did they rebel against him? Because he, he told them point blank. He said, you know, he said, I am going to gladly be your tyrant. He said, I am going to, he said, you're going to do what I say, or I'm going to run over you like a steamroller. And they said, oh, really? They said, goodbye. Had he followed the advice of the old men? Had he humbled himself? Had he lightened the load? Had he just decided I'm going to get on my knees and I'm just going to be a blessing? It about a whole different story. So how does this play out in child rearing? Uh, we knew we knew a family, a church we attended many years ago when we were young parents, so full of, full of large families, full of um, young families, and we were we were one of them. And um, there was a lady there, and and they were good folks. Okay, like I'm saying it sincerely. They were, I don't think they were doing porn. I don't think there was you know anything wicked going on. You know they weren't they weren't playing the Ouija board at night when nobody was looking. It wasn't it wasn't anything like that. They weren't gambling. But what the mom did was she made the children her slaves. And like I said, these, these families were large families and, and they were, they were most of us, you know, we had seven. A lot of those families had eight, nine, 10 kids. And, um, and so here's what happened as she's, as she's having children and, you know, you're having them, 18 months apart or less. She took her oldest daughter and she would have her oldest daughter take care of the baby all night with as with each successive younger baby. So mom didn't have to get up with the baby. Okay, now let me make a disclaimer. You ready? It is good that children share in the household duties. Absolutely. And some girls and boys never shoulder any household responsibilities. Okay, so we said that. 
But there is the other extreme where mom and daddy do nothing and they drive the children like they're little slaves. And I'm just going to say this just for the record. I know all about babies crying in the middle of the night. I know all about getting up with babies in the middle of the night. There's one thing you will never accuse me of. There's a few things. <laughs> one of them you'll never accuse me of. You go talk to my wife sometime. Don't ask her about my faults because that conversation won't be too long. <laughs> okay? But you can ask her. You can ask her if I'm a male chauvinist. She'll laugh out loud. Or she'll ask you, where did you get that crazy question? I mean, from the first baby. Man, I was. there's a lot of nights I'd get up in the middle of the night. Not because she didn't want to. Not because she wasn't awake. Because, you know, I, I knew it was hard on her. I wanted to help. Um, you know, I would I'd do all sorts of things. Okay, so I just want you to understand. You know, I, I believe I'm not against somebody helping mama. I could tell you a story about Joey and Mary. Joey, you're here. <laughs> I'm not going to tell that story. <laughs> it's comical, and Joey's heart was in the right place, but it was comical. <laughs> For 50 bucks, I'll tell you the story. <laughs> <laughs> so you know what happens when you make your children your slaves? Uh, listen, again, they ought to have jobs. Our children had jobs. We had them doing things. They need to learn to work. They need to learn that from you. Okay. But but there's an extreme. And and you know what happened this girl when she got older? Um, she decided that when she got married, and, and I've seen this more than once, she didn't want to have children. Do you know why? Because she'd already raised a family. Nice way to burn it, Mom. <laughs> Children or teens may not like to work. Most people don't. But they will resent you if they feel like they are being used. They understand. It's built in them. They need to help. God puts that in them. They, they, they may argue with you and fight with you. They understand that. But boy, you we all know the difference between doing our job and even going the second mile and being used. We, we all understand where that line is. That will cause rebellion. And there's more we can say, and we'll probably, we'll probably finish this thought up. Um, but boy, there's an example here. The old men said, Rehoboam, you know what every king wants, don't you? They, they, they want to be fanned, you know, and popping grapes in your mouth and, and, you know, and just the easy life. Cause you're the king, right? You're, you're the king, right? And they said, Rehoboam, if you'll do, if, if you won't do that, if you'll relinquish some of your freedoms, if you'll bow your will to your people. They will love you. And it is true. It's true in every home. It's true in every life. Strictness does not cause rebellion. Oh, there's some things that cause it. But that does not. Let's pray. Father, thank you for the simple truth. Lord, help us. Help us to be discerning, Lord. Help us to understand. Lord, help us to be wise. Lord, help us as we try to do the right thing. And Lord, help us not to draw wrong conclusions, Lord. Help us to think this through. Lord, help all the families in here. And again, Lord, some, their children are grown, but yet, Lord, they may still be a help to others. God, help us, help us that are beyond these years. Help us, Lord, to realize some of these principles still apply to us. 
in Jesus' name. With your heads bowed, I want to give you just a minute to talk to the Lord. Lord, thank you for your book. In Jesus' name, amen. You're dismissed.